It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck. Welcome, everybody. Mike Vaccaro with you once again in the front row. Behind the scenes, as always, J.R. Quitman, our creator, producer, and director. As always, we thank you for watching and listening to previous episodes. We've got a great one for you here today. We go to the Olympic stage, and it's volleyball legend Karch Karai. Made a name for himself growing up on the beaches of California. Won three national championships at UCLA. Multiple gold medals as a player and now a gold medal as a coach as well. He tells us all that and more. Episode number 39 of In the Front Row with Mike Vaccaro. It features volleyball legend Karch Karai. Well, Karch, first of all, uh, thanks so much for taking a little bit of time out of your schedule for us uh, today. I know you're a very busy man, right in the middle of everything. And, and we want to dive right into to you, your background, and, and what got you to, to where you are right now, going from being a player to now coaching and uh, certainly successful at all levels that you, you've been at. You're a guy, I guess you were, you were born in Michigan, but luckily for you, from a volleyball standpoint, you grew up in California. How important was it for you to grow up on the beaches of California and have that as your backdrop athletically with volleyball being uh, your sport? Well, it was certainly a big deal, but I actually didn't spend as much time in California as it might appear on the surface. Um, my father was uh, certainly both my parents were massive influences for me and supporters and uh, without them i wouldn't have been able to have the opportunities i've had in this wonderful sport but my father was born in hungary and he escaped after the failed revolution in 1956 when the hungarian people uh, thought they might be able to get their freedom back and then the uh, the russians sent in their tanks and crushed that as they did with lots of people in Eastern Europe. So he escaped and came to this country, made a new life for himself, but he had already fallen in love with volleyball. He had played on the Hungarian junior national team. And so once he arrived in this country, ended up uh, in Michigan, met my mom at the University of Michigan, and he continued playing volleyball. He played some on the beach, actually, in Detroit. They played some three-on-three -three triples volleyball there, but he also played a lot of indoor volleyball. And I'd I would tag along with him on weekends. He had a really busy schedule when he was in medical school, obviously, but we would drive around. I'd go with him to uh, watch him and his friends play adult tournaments around the state of uh, Michigan and Flint and Kalamazoo and Saginaw and Grand Rapids and everywhere else that his Ann Arbor YMCA team would play. And then we spent one year, my second grade year in California, he and my mom fell in love with Santa Barbara. Uh, and so they aspired to work their way back. And finally, we ended up moving back there in, uh, as I was in, let's see, the middle of ninth grade. But during that second grade year was when he and I really started bopping the ball back and forth. He would go down to the beach. He fell in love with beach volleyball, the doubles version there. And between games, I don't even know how he had the energy for me because he was in his internship year of medicine. He'd work like 100-hour weeks. But, uh, but between games, he and I, we have a little film of it somewhere, but he and I would just try to keep it going. You know, at first it would be five times, ten times, and whatever, and that had... That led to uh, a lifelong passion for volleyball, both the beach version and the indoor version for me. Uh, and so uh, really, it's thanks to him getting me started. Yeah, four decades of beach started when you were age 11, right? You played with your dad in a tournament. That was the first time? Exactly. We um, uh, In the 60s and 70s, I think he was a subscriber to Sports Illustrated, and occasionally we'd, um, well, we would, hope to see some word about volleyball. Uh, he was also a big fan of soccer. I remember he and I went to watch the 1970 World Cup uh, with Pelé leading Brazil in that tournament. And in Detroit, we went to a, an auditorium that normally would house boxing matches and watch closed circuit television. So I grew up a fan of certainly of volleyball, but also of soccer. And those were unusual things to be fans of at that in that day and age. And so we would scan uh, Sports Illustrated and constantly be disappointed. But then one day they did actually have an article on one of the all-time greats in American volleyball, 
a great, great player named Larry Rundle, who played on the 1968 Olympic team. So he was a great indoor player. And he was also a great beach player. So that was an unusual combination. And in the, in the article, it mentioned that he was the youngest ever to play uh, a beach volleyball tournament, since at that time, there were not really age group tournaments. There was just adult tournaments at various rankings or levels. And so he, uh, he was 11 when he played. And so we thought, you know what, that'd be kind of fun to tie that record. And so he and I played a tournament in uh, Corona del Mar, California. Those who live around here would know it as Big Corona. There's a lot of courts down there and they have tournaments. And I absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, we weren't living in Corona. We were living about an hour away in Claremont, California. But, uh, and it was just a novice tournament. It was the lowest ranking, but the, the gift that that tournament and my dad gave me was that, you know, it's so difficult for girls to grow up to be good women and for boys to grow up to be good men. Uh, we all go through that um, massive struggle and working through puberty and all the other challenges that go along with that. But in this one tiny <clears throat> slice of my life, I was given a gift of being able to stand toe to toe with grown men. We barely lost. We lost both of the games that we played, but I could already see fear in the eyes of uh, the man across the net who did not want to go back to their friends and say, I lost to an 11 year old kid. <laughs> so the other beautiful thing about that was <clears throat> since nobody wanted to lose to a kid, a scrawny, little uh, pipsqueak of a kid, they were relentless on me. In, in When you play two-on-two -two volleyball, if you and I are a partnership and you want to, and I'm the weaker offensive player, all you do is send every serve to me. I pass, you set, I attack, and now you uh, try to exploit the weakness. And so they were relentlessly attacking me and I didn't take that as anything but a challenge and an opportunity. And so uh, I think that was a huge blessing because um, nobody ever held back. Nobody ever felt sorry for me. They didn't want to lose to me. They attacked me and it made me much stronger and better in the long run. Pride now, though, it's a point of pride to say, hey, I lost to Karch Karai when he was starting in <laughs> his career, right? You know, now, now it's a, a point of emphasis that I probably talk about. Well, there's a, I, I forget his name, but there, uh, I, um, oh, Bill, I forget his last name. Anyway, uh, he tells a story about how he's undefeated against Karch. He's 1-0. and oh. And then his punchline at the end is, well, but Karch was 12 years old at the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you progressed from that point on, from 11 years old in a high school, became an outstanding player there, and eventually went on to UCLA, which was the power at the time in volleyball what uh, what was that recruiting process like because obviously you were getting a lot of notoriety during that time and probably had a lot of different options as far as college was concerned um by then i was uh, we had finally moved to santa barbara california in the middle of my ninth grade year and so i got to play uh for a great great coach rick olmstead at santa barbara high school and we had some really good teams and some of the best teams in southern california which meant that we had some of the best teams in the country because there wasn't, you know, very few states actually had boys high school volleyball as a sanctioned varsity sport at that time. But we were having a lot of success and, and a lot of the guys would go on to play in different colleges. Um, I was really interested in uh, playing for a top team and, and uh, attending a good school and contending for NCAA titles. So, um, and, and uh, so really the schools that interested me and were, and showed interest in me were UCLA and their legendary coach, Al Skates, who went on to win 19 NCAA titles, one of the all time great records. Um, I don't think it's the most, but uh, he coached there for 50 years and did an incredible job. Uh, and also USC. And it just seemed to be a better fit at UCLA because I was a part-time setter, part-time outside hitter at that time. And it was a good fit because 
another player who played that same kind of part dual role position was graduating and Al never guaranteed me a starting spot, but I could see that I might have a better chance to contend to play more. Then I would across town at USC where one of the all time great setters, pure setters for USA and in college, Dusty Dvorak was playing. Mm -hmm. And as we both finished our college careers, of course, we then played together for a, a quite a number of years on the USA team. But with a one setter offense, it was clear that I probably wouldn't get to play much for a couple of years behind him, as great as he was. And so that was another part of the attraction of UCLA. Well, you rolled there in 1978. You're also a, a biochemistry major as well. Uh, and you graduated with honors, a 3.55 GPA while you were balancing everything. How difficult was that to, to have that type of major and excel as well as you did on the volleyball courts? Um, not easy, but, um, you know, many of us who go, went on to compete in the Olympics or coach in the Olympics understand that we relish trying to do not easy things to do difficult things. I didn't really know what I wanted to do after college in terms of a career. Uh, my father was a doctor and a really successful one in physical rehabilitation. Uh, I wasn't really drawn to it from the sense of uh, that some might have, and I admire those who have it, this sense of serving others and helping them get to better health or keep good health. But it was kind of like, you know, my dad seems to really enjoy his career and he does a great job and that would seem to be a nice career. So I was on a track to attend medical school and I thought, well, uh, uh, for me, to be a better doctor, I think I would, uh, the way I learn, I like to understand things from the most fundamental level, uh, starting from the building blocks and working up. And so biochemistry seemed to be a natural, like to understand the body's processes from the molecular level. And so, and, and it was also reputed to be the second toughest major at UCLA behind three theoretical physics. And so I thought, all right, well, that's a pretty good combination. I'll challenge myself, I'll learn a lot. And then the other part of the challenge is that at that time, men's volleyball was probably the longest season of any NCAA sport. The day, uh, uh, this was before limitations were put on practice. So the first day of school, was the first day of practice. We had practice all fall, and then the season would end the first weekend of May. So it was a very long season that ran September to May, which meant I had to learn how to juggle and balance the competing needs of attending classes and taking care of business there and also being uh, as good as I could for our UCLA men's volleyball team. Well, you were pretty good. Uh, three national championships, as you said, 19 overall for Coach Gates, but you won there three years, three out of four years. Uh, what's your big takeaway of, of that accomplishment? And your record was 123 and five in your four years. That's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, well, our team was stocked with a lot of guys that, um, you know, you can, uh, a dividing question to ask any competitor is, what's stronger do you love winning more or do you hate losing more and our team was filled with guys who hated to lose and so <laughs> when you asked what stands out what stands out is the one we did not win the one we lost in the ncaa title match but against a great usc team in 1980 and they beat us in that one we were able to win the other three but I still, uh, that that's the one, the, one the, the losses, you mentioned there weren't many of them. I think you mentioned five. Uh, those stand out much more clearly than the wins. And that continued on with my UC, USA career uh, as, I, as I got to play for, you know, close to 10 years with USA and then beach career. And then, of course, now as a coach of the USA women's team. Yeah, you didn't lose often, so I could see how those stick out maybe a little bit more. But, but let's talk about some of the gold medals as we, we talk about the, the national team. You joined it full-time in 1981 and, you know, 1984, the first time, L.A. Olympics. So it's in your home state, in your home country, and you're the youngest player on that team. And you guys win gold medals. 
you know, again, you you won championships in college. Now winning a gold medal, were, were you thinking this was easy, or was this was it still a challenge for you? It was not easy by any means. And the other thing that people might forget, but I don't, and that is that that 1984 Olympics, as great as our win was, it was not. Uh, it was a weakened tournament. You might remember that in uh, four years previous, in 1980 the USA had led a boycott, uh, President Carter at that time had led a boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. And so the next Olympics in Los Angeles were boycotted by the Soviet Union and a group of Eastern Bloc countries. And so just the lack of the Soviet Union, but also Poland, Cuba and others made it for a weekend tournament and that increased our chances. We had gone into that aspiring to win some kind of a medal. We uh, dreamed of having the the chance to play the team that had been the best team and a great team for the previous seven years from about 1977 through 1984. The number one team in the world was the Soviet Union, the Russians. And uh, we learned from them. We aspired to compete against them. We were dreaming of playing against them in the gold medal match in Los Angeles. That didn't uh, turn out to be possible. But then, uh, so then we had probably even a better chance to not only medal, but maybe even win the tournament. And we did so, but some of us stayed on with that group uh, uh, to play not just one year later, some people did, but even four years later, because we wanted the chance to play against the best. And we got to do that the next year at the World Cup, we played the Soviet Union. And then two years after that 84 Olympics in the World Championships, and four years after in Seoul in another Olympic Games, a stronger Olympic Games. And so that was our dream really to play, to compete, against the deepest field possible with as many of the best teams possible and see how we could do. And we got that chance as we stayed on to play the next three or four years. Yeah, that's an interesting mindset. You want a goal, but in a sense, it sounds like you guys weren't totally happy. You wanted to do it against the best competition. I guess, you know, who doesn't? If you're a true competitor, you want to do that. And as you said, you were able to do that in, in 88, beating the, the Soviet Union team in Seoul. Yes, and... Um, it was interesting too because uh, the date, it's, it's either May 8th or May 9th. I think it was May 9th, 1984. Uh, we had, we were going on a tour of playing top teams across Eastern Europe. So we played Bulgaria, beat them a few times. And then we went to, uh, we ended up in the Soviet Union to play four friendlies with them. So the first night, ooh, I'm getting um, goosebumps thinking about this. Um, but the first night we are battling with the Soviet Union, we're in an absolute dogfight. Um, and to us, that was an honor to be on the court with them. They were the best team in the world. And it was an honor to be on their home floor and competing neck and neck. So we end up going five games and beating them in the fifth game. That was the first time the USA men had beaten them in 16 years since Larry Rundle, we mentioned him before, uh, since Larry Rundle and the USA men upset the Russians in the first round of competition in the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. So we're going crazy in the locker room and we're thinking, oh my gosh, wouldn't this be amazing to play against them in the finals for a gold medal a few months from now in Los Angeles. At the same time, uh, word had just seeped out and uh, our head coach, Doug Beal, learned of this, but didn't tell us in the locker room, waited to tell us the next day. But the Soviet boycott had been announced that evening. And in fact, I think the Soviet players had actually learned about it. Mm -hmm between the end of the fourth set and the beginning of the fifth set, because that was probably the one that we won easiest. And um, and so word got back to us later. Anyway, they were crushed. We felt awful for them. They had put their whole lives into this. We played them three more friendly matches, but we just killed them because the life had just been 
their will had been broken in the sense that they had found out they would not get to compete at the Olympic Games, even though they had completely earned the right to play and compete and, and try for another gold medal as they had won in the Moscow Olympics. So we were there right in the midst of this, in their country, actually, as this was announced. And uh, we were down too, but of course it was a thousand times less uh, than what they were feeling. We just felt awful for, for them. They were a good, gun, good bunch of guys. We had a huge amount of respect for them. Loved competing against them, but didn't get to do it in those Olympics a few months later. Yeah, I'm sure playing against the best, you know, competition brings the best out of you as well. So, uh, again, a couple of uh, gold medals as a, a player, great accomplishments for you. And then you retired from indoor. Was it an easy transition to go back to, to the beach? Again, you started back when, you know, you're 11 years old. Did you think you were going to have almost, you know, four decades uh, of beach volleyball in your career? I absolutely did not think that. Um, I played through with the USA men from 1981 to uh, through most of 1989. And then I decided to get back to the game that I had played a lot growing up and just played part time for a while, the beach game. Not even knowing that it would eventually or soon in just a few years become an Olympic sport. But in fact, it did. And so I got uh, actually a, uh, the a huge good fortune and blessing of getting to compete in a third Olympic Games as beach volleyball was added for the first time to the Olympic program in 1996 in Atlanta. And I got to play with Kent Steffes there. We got to play against our great friends and American uh, um, com fellow competitors, Mike Dodd and Mike Whitmarsh in the finals. And we were really proud to show the world that USA is really good in beach volleyball. But that really started an avalanche and an explosion. Beach volleyball has become one of the most popular tickets and sports at the Olympic Games each year. And it also exploded in growth around the world. So, you know, you can have teams from Switzerland and Latvia winning medals because uh, a lot of countries figured out, well, it's very difficult to find six or seven really good players and make an indoor team. But if we can just find two, we can make a very competitive beach team. So a lot of countries around the world have invested a lot of resources in their one or two top teams knowing that they have a, a, a much better shot at making an impact uh, at uh, tournaments like the World Championships or the Olympics. And it's a growing sport on the college level as well. Do you feel like you guys, again, getting that exposure in the Olympics starting in Atlanta, help you know start that, get the ball rolling with, with the, you know, how important it's become now on the college level? It's really interesting. I think sand volleyball, and this is right now only on the women's side. I hope eventually that it will expand to the men's side. But I think sand volleyball from maybe the first idea and the first uh, teams saying, yeah, let's form some sand teams. Let's figure out a way to just um, from grassroots start this. From that time, from the initial idea, to actually getting NCAA sanction as the, I think it was the 90th sport that would have an NCAA championships happened probably faster than any sport previously. So it just literally exploded. And one of the things I love about college beach volleyball, it's a unique format that's somewhat like tennis where you have a duel and you have a number of competitions going on in beach volleyball. Basically, each college, each institution has five teams. They have their number one doubles and two, three, four, and five. And so the ones play, the twos, but you do, and, and three of your teams have to win. But on any given day, you don't know if it's going to be the fives that are going to win the whole duel for the whole school or if it's gonna be the twos or the ones, everybody plays an equal role. And, and it's, uh, uh, it's really fun to watch because uh, it doesn't matter what team you're on, you, you play an equal and integral role in the success or failure, the win or the loss of your given institution, your school. So really fun format to watch. 
Um, unfortunately, it often competes with the men's indoor NCAA title on the same initial weekend or so in May. I wish they would separate those a little because they're both great championships. Yeah, great sports on the college level that you're seeing these days. And so you talked about you weren't sure what you were going to do post graduation, but now you're coaching. You know, was that something, when did you think that would be something that, that you would enjoy and, and something that, again, you would have success with? I got to play for a very long time, play high-level volleyball, probably from the time I was about 15, uh, when I first started placing high in the top beach tournaments, uh, to when I retired at the age of, I think, 46 was my final season. So I got to play over 30 years of volleyball, of high-level volleyball. Um, through almost all of that time, I assumed I did not have the patience to be a coach. And to, I, I would coach some at summer camps and clinics, but those are short-term things as opposed to working with a team for a full season or multiple years. Uh, but So I really didn't even think I had it in me, and I wasn't thinking a lot about coaching. Uh, and playing so long, it gave me a, a very late start in coaching compared to other people my same age who've been doing it decades longer than I have. But finally, uh, one of our sons, uh, our sons decided to play some volleyball once they got to high school. And one of our sons had a horrible season his freshman year. He, was, he made the varsity team at his high school and they lost every match, uh, 31 matches, but they all also lost every set of every match. So they went zero and 93 that year. And one, one set, they were even winning 20 to 10, but ended up losing 23, 25. So uh, I think it was at the end of that set, my wife said to me, Karch, you, you gotta help these guys out. All, all, we were just like, please, could they just taste one, a uh, tiny, dr not even a drop of water, but just <laughs> some mist of water of success and, and maybe win a set at least and not go zero and 93. So I asked the school if I could become involved. They were very kind and allowed me to do so. And I got hooked on it. And uh, the first thing I did was sign up for, I knew a lot about volleyball, but I wanted to approach it as a total beginner. And so I signed up for a, like a coaching 101 three-day coaching clinic with one of my favorite coaches of all time, Marv Dunphy, one of the great, great coaches in this sport. And he and I still work together. He's a mentor of mine and he helps us uh, with the coaching of our USA women's team. But I signed up for, his, uh, for a clinic that he was hosting at Pepperdine University in Malibu and uh, uh, took lots of notes and then got to work with the boys and they got, I'll never forget, you know, they worked really hard in the preseason and played a team that had just beaten them like a drum the year before and they won that first set 25-19 and they went nuts. It was like they had just won the NCAA title or an Olympic gold medal. Uh, and it was just so uh, gratifying to see them taste a little bit of success. Basically, the first time they'd won in close to two years, even gotten to 25 before somebody else. But then, of course, had to calm them down. Hey, guys, you know, if you could do that once, we could even maybe do it again or even three times and win this match. And they went on to win the match. And they kept doing better and better each year until they ended up winning a section title my my final season. So that was my uh, start in coaching and it really infected me with the bug. And of course, a, a, a huge blessing for me. I'm, I'm really grateful because I got to stay involved in this sport that I have such a great passion and uh, for and, and have loved for so many years. And now I still get to be involved in the sport of volleyball. And so the whole doctor thing and medical school dropped off a long time ago. I'm still, I guess, avoiding growing up and doing a real job. Well, well yeah, it's it's a lot better than a real job. I know we're, we're getting close to our time limit here, but I, I got to touch on the, the U.S. national women's team again. Medals for you, bronze and then the gold medal. You're, you're a limited company as far as uh, gold medal as a player, gold medal as a coach as well. Is it a different kind of 
high when you get a gold as a, as a coach? You just talked a little bit about their coaching your son's team, but what was that like, that transition? Um, I love coaching this team. It's a really special group of women um, who are not only just great people, people of real character and integrity, but also great volleyball players. And so uh, I've gotten to be a part of this program since 2009, so over 13, probably 13 and a half years now. And, um, and it's just an honor and a privilege to get to work with them on a, on a daily basis. Uh, that culminated in, uh, we were also incredibly grateful that the Tokyo Olympics could even happen. It was obviously delayed, postponed a year because of all the lockdowns around the world with COVID. And, uh, and there were still real questions about whether the Olympics would even happen. Uh, I'm not even sure how much of the Japanese general population supported them happening, but we're really thankful that they did happen, even if nobody was in the stands, because once that first whistle blew, we didn't even notice that uh, people were in attendance or not. We were so focused on competing and on uh, trying to make the team across the net uncomfortable. But um, I, I, when our team won uh, last year in Tokyo, I think it was, it, it was probably more impactful on me, um, blew me away more than any of the gold medals I had been a part of as a competitor on the court two indoors and one on the beach. And I think, I think one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons why was all the suffering that the women's program had gone through. The women have competed previous to that, had competed in 11 Olympic games in the 1964 Olympic games. That was the first games for indoor volleyball. Uh, and they added both women and men to that Olympics. But in 11 prior Olympics, the women had won five medals, uh, three silver and two bronze. And then there was a 12th one where our women were good enough and qualified, but didn't get to compete in 1980 in that boycott uh, I touched on earlier. So finally, in our 13th, that is the USA women's 13th Olympic Games that they had qualified for, uh, they finally stood at the top of the mountain. And, and the suffering that's involved when it's kind of like trying to climb Mount Everest every four years. And when you get with so close, you can see the pinnacle, you're only a hundred feet away and you end up short. There's just, there's a lot of, and, and you don't actually make the summit. There's uh, a lot of suffering that goes along with that. As opposed to when I played on the men's team, a bunch of us were new. We joined the team, as you mentioned, in 1981. Three years later, we play, we win. It's like it came really easily. On the women's side, it did not come easily at all. There were great, great players before this group. There were great, great coaches before. But for a variety of reasons, the teams fell short. So finally making that summit, with this badass group of women uh, who were just incredibly gritty and, and, and overcame so much adversity during the Tokyo Olympics. It was incredibly meaningful. It just absolutely blew me away. Be I think most of all because of all the suffering the program had gone through previous and had, bec had come so close. Uh, we were very close four years previous or five years previous in Rio and lost a heartbreaking semi-final 15-13 in the fifth set to Serbia. And so we were able to avenge that and play Serbia in the same semi-final in Tokyo and beat them 3-0 and go on to win and beat a team Brazil that had beaten the USA women in the 08 final and the 12 and the 12 London final. So there were all kinds of stories that really tied it together along with the fact that it was finally back in Tokyo where 
uh, indoor Olympic volleyball was born in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. So you put it all together and it just, uh, it left me speechless and I was so happy for our women. Yeah, you're a former broadcaster, so you know the importance of storylines and you had plenty of them there. Uh, coaching now, you're still coaching. Will we see you on the sidelines again, the next Olympics with the women? Yes, I signed up for another, uh, you know, normally you would say another four years, but actually it's three years because of the postponement of the Tokyo Olympics. And so it's strange because this year, that is the, the first year of a new Olympic cycle, we are now, uh, as you and I speak, um, we're actually just under the wire. Two days ago was the two-year mark Wow. Uh, for opening ceremonies in the Paris Olympics. So we are now less than two years away. And it's just, it's stunning that this is all happening so fast. But so for this year, our team will be getting ready for world championships. Next year, there are some big tournaments, including the, uh, the biggest chance to qualify for the Paris Olympics. And right then, the year after that in 2024 are the Olympic games themselves. So it's gonna be happening really fast, we have plenty of people who are returning from the gold medalist team from Tokyo in 2021. And we've got a lot of exciting younger players who until this year, because of lockdowns in 2020 and limited opportunities in 2021, really haven't had a chance for two or three years. And now are finally getting a chance uh, to play some of their first volleyball for the USA women's team. And some young people doing some exciting things. So we're going to see how it all fits together over the next uh, less than two years. Yeah, it's going to come a lot quicker. For for people watching this, how can they follow you? On you Are you on social media? How can they follow the, the team as well as you get ready for the next Olympics coming up? I'm not actually very active on social media. I think that's a really uh, a real double-edged sword there. Um, I guess the downside of social media is just how nasty can pe uh, people can be when they can hide behind anonymity and and say the most awful things about the players on our team and or other teams or college teams. And so I think there's a uh, a real downside to that too. Um, so I'm not active there, but people can certainly go to the official USA Volleyball website to find out more about us uh, and find out our, our next competition. We're going to be playing three uh, exhibition matches, friendly matches against one of the other top teams in the world, Turkey, late in August. I'm looking at my calendar. I guess that would be Saturday, August 27. Sunday the 28th and Tuesday the 30th, and those will be in the Southern California area, two of them at the Long Beach uh, State Pyramid and one at UC San Diego. And then we will depart in the middle of September to go play in the World Championships, which are gonna be co-hosted by uh, Netherlands and Poland. They'll do a great job hosting what is a always the toughest tournament to win in volleyball because the 24 best teams in the world are always there. And so we're looking forward to seeing how we can uh, fare and compete there. It'll be a good benchmark now that we are within the two year window uh, for Paris. So lots going on in 2022. And then all of our players will um, will wrap up our season in October. And then our almost all of our players will head overseas because they lead dual lives. They spend a lot of time with us from April to October. And then the other uh, half of their volleyball life is that they go to overseas to peop uh, to countries like Japan, China, Brazil, Germany, France, Italy, Turkey, Poland, and other places to play professional volleyball in leagues outside of our country. And some of them even stay and play in the new professional league that just finished its second season earlier this year, and that is the American League called Athletes Unlimited. So lots of opportunities for them to play professional volleyball between October and April when we start back up uh, with uh, very serious training. Well, if you know nothing about volleyball, I think you still know the name Karch Karai. Uh, Karch, outstanding, amazing career that you have had. It's great to see you continuing with it on the coaching side and, the, and continuing to to do what you can to, again, get this sport out there. You know, obviously you will watch it during the Olympics, but to watch it year round and do different things, it's it's great to see that. And 
And I can't thank you enough for spending a little time with us here today to, to share your memories and, and to share your story with us here today. Thanks, Mike. It's been great to visit with you and I wish you good luck and, and all of your listeners and viewers and um, uh, just have a wonderful July and excited just as, of, of course, so many people follow college sports and it's this is an exciting time as we are just about to get going with preseason of the fall college sports season, whether you're a fan of college football or on the women's side of college men, uh, women's volleyball that will ramp up. Actually, you know, in less than two weeks, they'll start yeah. their preseason. So this is always an exciting time, whatever sport you follow. Wow, great stuff from an absolute Olympic legend there. Karch Karai, gold medalist, national champion. Great stories there. Our thanks as well to Sam Gore, his partner on some broadcasts who helped connect us with Karch so we can hear those stories here today. As always, we thank you for watching and listening, and we remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you don't miss another episode, as next week is episode number 40. Thanks for joining us here today in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Have a great day, everybody.